Uh, this morning on the agenda, we have uh, Myron Franz, and uh, essentially the topic is what the uh, economic impact of the government uh, shutdown uh, is going to be on uh, Minnesota. And uh, my intent is not to uh, debate uh, the issues uh, on the federal level, but to just focus, if you will, on that particular question, what is the economic impact of the shutdown on the state of Minnesota? And uh, there has been a few news uh, reports uh, about the economic impact nationally, and uh, uh, Commissioner Franz was uh, quoted in the paper one day of, in a very general way of uh, some of the uh, issues that may surface. So I uh, have asked him to uh, testify here uh, this morning to expand on those uh, comments. And uh, I think the way we will proceed, uh, simply ask uh, Commissioner Franz to uh, do his overview and then uh, take questions after, uh, after he's done. The way he put it is that it can go in so many different directions. I think we want to make sure he gets a chance to get all of his testimony in and then take questions. So, Commissioner Franz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm Myron Franz, Commissioner, <clears throat> Minnesota Management Budget. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, start off this week at Ways and Means, and I'm happy to be here again. Uh, one of the things that I want to testify about is, is, the government, is the federal government shutdown effect on Minnesota, not just the uh, agency effects, but a little bit more generally, too. As a way of background, you know, our federal government has been shut down for 24 days now. And for those 24 days, there's about 6,100 of the 17,000 federal workers who live in Minnesota have been furloughed, furloughed or they're working without pay. So one of the problems they have, the 6,100, is not knowing when they're going to get their next paycheck. For 24 days, our state agencies uh, have been spending many, many hours trying to get the information from federal agencies about the programs that Minnesota administers and services that we provide the people of Minnesota that may be federally funded. And it's even more difficult uh, for Minnesotans to get that information. We have trouble getting consistent information from the agencies because in many cases those agencies are not open. Uh, to the, when there are some people there, it's hard to get information and sometimes it's conflicting. But you can imagine the frustration that people have when they're calling uh, trying, from us trying to get information and they, they have a, even more difficulty getting information. So one of the things that we've been doing for the past 24 days is the state of Minnesota has been providing ongoing cash flow funding for the cost of some federal programs. Now, this is not an unusual situation. As you might know, in many cases, state programs are funded or reimbursed by the federal government. So we begin the activity in the state of Minnesota relying on later reimbursement through agreements with the agency or through appropriations from Congress. And so we're, it's not unusual that we are cash flowing or providing state funds in advance of federal funds. However, now we're seeing the reimbursement getting delayed in more and more programs. So this obviously gives me concern from a budgetary standpoint. Uh, one of the, as commissioner of MMB, my job is to make recommendations to the governor and lieutenant governor about responding to this federal government shutdown and to make sure that the state is not responsible for federal, ob for the federal, I'm sorry, for the, financial obligations of the federal government. We're clearly in uncharted territory in this 24-day 24 24-day 24 shutdown. It's already the longest in U.S. history, and we're not, I'm not aware of any immediate uh, compromise in the works. But before I go into the technical details, I do want to express my concern to the people who are actually feeling the direct results of the federal government shutdown. I'll be discussing what's happening at the state agency level to try to react to the shutdown, but my first thoughts obviously are with those people who, through no fault of their own, are experiencing the loss of a paycheck or the uncertainty of needed payments for food and shelter, farmers and small business owners waiting to make loans, waiting to make investments, and other fellow Minnesotans on our, who live on our tribal lands that are no longer receiving health services and other funds from the federal government. And this shutdown is bringing a lot of uncertainty to the lives of mo some of the most vulnerable among us. <clears throat> the federal government cannot give us clear guidance on when Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, benefits will run out. We do have information that they will be paid through the month of February, but beyond that, we're uncertain. We also don't know how long the schools may have, to, at what point the schools may have to stop their lunch programs funded through the Department of Agriculture. Uh, if we get into more detail, Assistant Commissioner Nikki Farrago is here from DHS to talk about some of the SNAP uh, issues directly at that point. But the majority of the, the uh, SNAP program feeds 
uh, children, elderly, and people with disabilities as part of the, part of the uh, funding source there. About a quarter of the federal government is closed right now, and the agencies include the Department of Agriculture. This includes, as I mentioned, the Federal Nutrition Service, or the SNAP, and school lunch programs. The Farm Service Agency, they have about 75 offices around the state that are closed. They have about 425 employees. And the farmers are not receiving technical assistance at this time, nor are they able to process loans and get loans approved that they've requested. As you know, the Food and Drug Administration is closed right now, putting in question the amount of uh, uh, inspections being made by the FDA. The Department of Commerce is closed. And which includes the Small Business Administration. So there are a number of small businesses that are waiting for loans from the SBA. Another thing about the Department of Commerce is they put out a lot of information, technical information, uh, economic information, and activity that investors rely on, businesses rely on. And so that information is not available right now. The Department of Homeland Security is closed, which includes the Coast Guard, TSA folks that are working at the airports uh, without pay, FEMA, uh, is now closed some, uh, from Duluth. You may know that we're, we have a request in for some FEMA funds because of the October storm that hit there that caused at least nine to $10 million of damage. All that is on hold pending approval uh, from the, F, uh, the FEMA office. The Department of Housing Urban Development is closed, causes programs for those people who are trying to finance homes with an FHA loan, sometimes for a first home buyer. Department of Justice is closed, which includes courts. We know that the federal court in Minnesota has declared all, Mr. all Minnesota district court personnel essential, but the money may begin running out this week. The FBI is uh, working without pay. The Department of State is closed. The Department of Interior, which includes the national parks, such as Voyagers National Park, Grand Portage National Monument, Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, Pipestone National Monument, St. Croix National Scenic R Riverway, and the North Country National Scenic Trail. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is closed. Indian Health Services, as I mentioned, and the Environmental Protection Agency. The Department of Treasury is closed. The IRS is closed. Now, they are maintaining some offices. They have announced that they plan to open for filing season in Jan on January 28th of this month. You may know that the Minnesota Department of Revenue cannot open filing season until after <clears throat> the IRS opens their filing season. So we hope that that uh, does not slip because this is a a difficult tax filing year anyway and we right now though the problem is if you need information or if you have questions technical questions you're not going to be able to get through on the IRS phones they're only man, uh, putting people in charge of of preparing for the filing season and in some <clears throat> in some cases issuing refunds so there are a lot of questions out there and, and uh, that people want to have about the new tax bill that was passed in December of 2017 the other thing that's difficult is to, if you have a, a fraud problem maybe a uh, uh, identity theft problem that can occur with your tax filing, that, that uh, those services are not available. The Department of Transportation is closed. So the failure to fund federal government has created more work for state government. We've been preparing federal shutdown now. It's become, a, unfortunately, a regular part of the work at Minnesota Management Budget. We have a statewide contingency response team that we have to stand up whenever we have these threatened or real shutdowns. And in these response team meetings, we gather information, we evaluate the impacts in the budget on human resources, on labor relations, on continuity of operations and communications. Since 2013, we have planned for 10 federal shutdowns and our current shutdown is the fourth actual shutdown since 2013. Minnesota depends on government, uh, federal government funds. This state receives approximately a billion dollars a month in federal grants. For example, Medicaid, highway funding, TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, Veterans Health Care, Food Security Programs such as SNAP, and School Lunch. Anytime a significant funding partner is shut down, I become concerned. And usually we know that a typical shutdown is short term, maybe a few days or maybe a week or so. But now we have approximately 3,000 state workers who are funded by federal grants. The layoffs of those workers, if we decide to make that decision, require a 21 to 30 day notice under our bargaining agreements under the labor contract. So we need to assess at what point should we send out notices to those employees if in fact we're not convinced that the federal government is going to make good on those payments or reimburse us if we continue to fund those workers. More than 4,500 federal workers in Minnesota are furloughed, furloughed and 1,000 of those have applied for unemployment insurance 
<clears throat> according to deed. Now, as a state government, we do, not have the, we do not have the guarantee that the federal government will reimburse state spending for federally funded activity. During this 24-day shutdown, I've heard countless stories of how it is affecting Minnesotans' lives. But uncertainty is not good for the economy either. The longer the shutdown goes on, the more uncertainty it will bring. For example, since the U.S. Department of Commerce and the Department of Agriculture are closed, data such as construction data, trade deficit data, new, homes, new home sale data are not being released. Investors rely on this information to make trades and businesses and to, and to plan their investments. Farmers are not getting the data they need from the Department of Agriculture to plan for this planting season. Nor are farmers getting the technical assistance they need from the farm service, farm service agencies across the state. The shutdown can have an effect on economic activity. Since businesses may delay decisions and Minnesota's, Minnesotans may stop making investments if they cannot complete mortgages through the USDA or FHA or a business loan through the Small Business Association, which has been closed for the past 24 days. The federal government has left, us, has left us in a difficult situation. If there is no leadership on this issue from out of Washington, D.C., I've been advising Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor uh, Flanagan on their options and what opportunities they have to step forward and provide leadership in this case where the federal sh shutdown continues. As Commissioner of MMB, I've asked agency leaders to gather and analyze information. In prior shutdowns, Minnesota's kept most programs and services running and has been reimbursed by the federal government later. MMB and the agencies are in the process of analyzing our budget situation and in the, in the process of making recommendations to the governor and lieutenant governor about the risk involved in advancing state funding for federal programs based on the likelihood that we will be reimbursed. Because at this time, there is no guarantee. And I'm happy to take questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you for letting me make those remarks. Uh, just uh, <clears throat> you mentioned the uh, commissioner and the SNAP program would you like uh, that testimony now before we move to general questions or? Mr. Chair, I would recommend that the Assistant Commissioner Nikki Farrago come up because I think there are some uh, uh, issues there that, because that is coming up today, in the next several days, we are in the process of responding to that program and it's 40 to $44 million a year, uh, sorry, a month in payments that are being made to people. So I think it's important that we understand what the situation is there. Okay, why don't we do that then before we move to questions? And if you could identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chair, members, I'm Nikki Farrago from DHS. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Children and Family Services, which includes oversight of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, commonly referred to as SNAP. Um, so we have been in communication with the USDA. As Commissioner Franz uh, mentioned, um, the USDA is, has been impacted by the federal shutdown, so um, the employees are furloughed. There's a, there's a skeleton crew that's working on this issue, and we've been in communication with both the federal office and our regional office. Um, we have been told last week that benefits are available through the month of February. However, those benefits will need to be issued early and early means by January 20th. That means that we have been working with our counties and tribes and other partners to get the information out to ensure that those <coughs> benefits can be released early. Um, that involves looking at our IT systems to make sure that the IT system has the capacity to process the applications. It's also meant working with our vendor. SNAP uh, benefits are issued on the EBT card. So we've worked with our EBT vendor who also serves 29 other states across the country to ensure that the benefits can actually be loaded onto the card um, once the counties and tribes do their work on eligibility. Um, that date is um, January 16th that the vendor needs the benefits loaded onto the card to meet the January 20th deadline. So the date that we've shared with counties and tribes and asking them to process all applications is January 15th, which is tomorrow. Um, we've asked, um, we've communicated with them late last week to process those applications that needed um, additional um, certification or recertification um, late Friday, and we know anecdotally that um, several offices were working throughout the weekend um, and are working today and through close of business tomorrow to ensure 
that all of those applications are processed. Okay, and if uh, <clears throat> you don't mind perhaps staying at the table uh, just in case there are <clears throat> questions that are follow-up. And, uh, Commissioner, did you have anyone else from any of the other departments that you thought uh, might be uh, available to testify and you'd like to include? Not at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, why don't we uh, start then with the uh, questions, and we've developed the list here. Rep uh, Representative Hurtas is first. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Carlson. Um, Mr. Franz, you have mentioned that uh, the states often fund front-end uh, federal programs, and I don't think anybody was unclear about that. My question to you would be, what is the normal turnaround time or billing cycle that the states usually wait for reimbursement? What, what kind of delay is there in terms of fronting the money? Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative, well, that's an excellent question, and there's no good answer to it. Uh, it it re depends on every single program. It's ama The complexity is pretty amazing. It depends. Sometimes we have federal agreements with an agency, and those agreements have the, the schedule in place. Sometimes the appropriation itself from Congress has those automatic payments that are made. So that is what we're doing right now is tracking every single federal program, and there are hundreds of these through all the different agencies to track of when is the payment normally received, what's the normal delay, as you mentioned, what's the normal delay, and how much now are we beyond that normal delay in terms of the number of programs and the amount of money, because the governor's asked me to give him that risk factor, if you will, and which I think is what, what you're sort of getting at is what kind of risk is building for the state of Minnesota as we delay longer and longer these reimbursement payments, uh, that that number is growing. And we, we don't have that answer yet, but we hope to have that in, a, in another day or so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess kind of a follow-up question would be, what has been your ordinary experience that uh, our state generally has as a cash flow management issue? How many hundreds of millions of dollars per month are we fronting? And, you know, what, what kind of is the total picture there? Mr. Franz. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, well, as I mentioned, uh, we get uh, somewhere around a billion dollars a month from the federal government for all these various programs, and many of those go directly, and most of those, frankly, go directly to recipients. And so there, there's no reimbursement lag, and, 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 and by far the largest majority of the payments of the billion dollars go directly to institutions or to individuals. I would say that the reimbursement uh, concern that we have is in the range of several hundred million dollars, but that's part of our analysis. Is to, but that's uh, sort of in the ballpark, I would say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Franz, I have two questions. One is on the interior side. Uh, we've seen news reports in other states where national parks have been impacted uh, by vandalism because of the inability to secure the sites and. Just wondering what's happening in Minnesota. Are our, are our parks uh, secure? Have we seen any damage? Uh, what's the plan on trying to protect those sites? And then the second question is with the chronic waste and disease outbreak, uh, my understanding is that the DNR works with federal <laughs> sharpshooters on culling the herd. And I, had, I think at the DNR roundtable last week, they mentioned that that may be put on hold because those are funded through USDA. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, let me take the last one first. Uh, the, uh, because the USDA, like a lot of activities <clears throat> of the USDA, food inspection and other kinds of programs are not, are not now functioning, that would, my estimation, that those folks know better than I, but that would be one of those programs that would typically not be continued during a shutdown. It's not considered, uh, it's on their essential list, I, I don't believe. So that's Probably, I'll double check for you on that. On the other one, on the Interior Park Service, one, you, you mentioned a really interesting point there because as we've heard in some of the other states, some of the national parks, because of the vandalism, uh, they, they were going to allow the parks to remain open but and just sort of, sort of collect trash or whatever, but it just wasn't working. There was just too many people and, and vandalism or just disruption in the normal upkeep. But we haven't, really, uh, haven't heard that being reported here, but I'll check on that too for that. But I have not heard of any reports so far. Representative Hansen. Uh, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative or Commissioner France. Right. It clicked in my brain when you talked about the filing season and that we can't start our filing season until the feds open theirs. What happens if 
as some of the reports and some of the comments from our president that this is going to go on for multiple years. Would that mean that we couldn't have open our filing system season because the, I, the federal IRS wasn't open? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative, you know, that, that whole question of the IRS is, as a former revenue commissioner, I understand it. Because as you, when you get ready for a filing season uh, at the Department of Revenue, you're working pretty much around the clock with people on programs, making sure everything's ready to go. So right now, well, this is several weeks ago. The last I heard, there was about 10,000 people working at the IRS, and they have over 100,000 employees. And they were just sort of maintaining the status quo. They've added the fact that they're now going to pr process refunds, which is, so I'm assuming they brought some more people back. But I I'm nervous about the filing season open on, opening on time with the IRS because I know what it takes administratively to get an agency ready to open for filing season. And that uh, would be a real problem. And it's... It goes just beyond uh, the, fi I mean, the filing season would just be critical. To eat into our filing system time this year, of all years, would really be difficult given the complexity and the changes that were made at the federal level. There are a lot of questions people have about their federal return. Not as many for the state return because our state income tax didn't change, right? It's really the, the, the changes in the federal return that have people up in arms and need, need information. So that's the, the lack of uh, technical assistance is a problem. The question about filing on opening the filing season is an issue that I'm really concerned about. What is that, two weeks from today, right. So uh, this is not the year you want to shorten that season. And, and uh, you just cannot have the IRS operate with 10,000 or 15,000 employees out of 100, over 100,000 employees and expect to be able to maintain security, integrity of the uh, identity theft issues. So I'm equally concerned about that and what might happen in the long term. Representative uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, you stated that uh, Minnesota receives about a billion dollars um, per month from the federal government. And what percentage or how much of that is being affected by the partial government shutdown? Certainly not all of that billion, correct? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative, correct. Uh, as I mentioned, a large number uh, in the Medicaid uh, area, there are large payments made, or a large amount of the payments are made directly to individuals and institutions that, are been, that have been appropriated. Since we, about three-fourths of the federal government has been funded. Uh, and so we're only dealing with about 25 percent of the federal government hasn't. So that's a, about the same percentage of those funds that we think are at risk under the federal shutdown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so would you be able to prepare for this committee um, uh, like a memo, something in memo form of what the cash flow is right now, what, what you are currently kind of backfilling um, that the, you know, from those funds? Uh, is that something you could provide to the committee? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, I would be delighted to. I've been asked to, to do that for my boss, so I will, <laughs> I'm working on that right now. So we'll hope to have that in the next several days, and we'll share that with you when we get done with our analysis to show you what funds are being potentially disrupted and what that delay is in those funds that we, we're not getting the regular reimbursement for. So I'd be glad to share that with you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bean, you're putting that <coughs> together anyway. Why don't you uh, share that with the uh, committee then, yes. if you well, would? Yes. Um, Representative Scott, was that it? That's it. Okay, Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I have two different questions, and one is um, to piggyback on Representative Scott. She had, she had asked about the state of Minnesota not receiving payments. I just want to drill down a little bit more. What about Minnesotans not receiving payments that they get? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative, well, as you, I think it was... I'm losing track of time already uh, this session, which is a bad sign this early in session, right? Uh, it was last week where I th believe that the Congress passed. I think the president signed authorization, authorizing uh, payment for workers. So the workers' salaries, I believe, uh, was uh, will has been guaranteed to be paid. But that doesn't cover the you know the contractors who only get paid if they work. So those people are simply out of luck. But with respect to people who were in. Uh, supposed to get a, a payment, I mean, the SNAP is another good example. Let's assume that runs out at the end of February. If this continues and that runs out at the end of February, then we've never had, I don't know what that situation would entail. We would assume that the federal government would stand up to its obligations and, and to make payments to people who receive federal benefits directly, but, uh, you know, we're in a whole new territory here, so that's a, a question. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And my other question is about, um, do you have any information on the impacts to cities and the state as it relates to getting um, rental assistance from Section 8 housing program? Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, we know that there are disruptions in those payments that are happening now. And one of the things that we're trying to uh, assess is, uh, you know, can it, most of those checks go to the owners or the uh, managers of the housing directly. And so in many cases we're, work, we're trying to figure out how much uh, delay are they receiving and can they maintain uh, the premises for their, the people who are receiving the housing. Uh, that's a, frankly a complicated area that we hope to have some more answers to in the next several days, but it's a great concern to us because obviously people's housing, especially in the wintertime, is a critical uh, function. Great, thank you. Seeing uh, Representative Bernardi's hand go up, it reminded me of a question that I have on higher education. Uh, federal aid, you know, grants, uh, federal uh, guaranteed loans, and so on. Uh, I don't recall you mentioned that with your initial comments, but what's the status of uh, being that we're beginning the next semester and both our public and private uh, colleges and universities uh, of the uh, impact of student uh, grants and aid? Well, that, uh, Mr. Chair, that's a good question. Let me can we give you an anecdote that I heard about that, that I hadn't thought about, but there are some cases where schools require you to submit a transcript of your IRS filings to make sure you're up to date or, or whatever in some programs. Well, it's almost impossible to get a copy of your IRS transcript uh, these days from the IRS, so it's sometimes impossible to meet those uh, higher education requirements for, for some students. Both uh, Minnesota State and the University of Minnesota uh, both receive a lot of federal funds and have a lot of grants. Uh, many of those grants uh, have not been affected because they're not part of the government shutdown, but one of the things we'll be doing, there are some Department of Justice grants actually that go to Minnesota State. So that's probably what we're trying to analyze. Are those reimbursements being delayed? Because once again, Minnesota State, un not unlike the state of Minnesota, will cash flow the activities assuming that they're going to get the reimbursement from the federal government. So we're we're looking into that for the state of uh, Minnesota State and the University of Minnesota, but we have not heard of any serious disruptions in the reimbursements from those two institutions at this time. Okay. Um, Representative Bernardi, would you? Um, Representative Mariani. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and um, Commissioner. Um, first of all, let me just uh, express my gratitude for the uh, incredible extra work that you and your people are now um, having to do. And I think it's important that we uh, acknowledge that. I suspect that that is happening um, in a number of, of areas of state government. You, you have a difficult job to begin with. Um, and, you know, helping us here to be able to uh, understand the state of our finances and how it interacts with our policies and processes. And now you've got a huge other job uh, sort of other job, but but a huge uh, component. So thank you for that. I am I am struck by your comment about uncharted territory, um, and um, I mean clearly we were in the you know historically longest uh, shutdown uh, of the federal government. Um, I personally think it's incredibly irresponsible. Um, but beyond that, I'm. Um, increasingly worried about what the implications might be for the state beyond uh, what our, our past experiences. Um, and so I guess my question really has to do with, uh, with two components here. Uh, and I suspect that this goes on, we, we'll probably get into deeper conversations as we go along. Uh, but uh, the first one really has to do with this whole issue of, of uh, cash flowing, of reimbursements, uh, an expectation of reimbursements. Um, and I know I'm probably asking you to speculate, but at what point does, are we as a state moving beyond a normed um, uh, thinking about um, uh, uh, reimbursements um, and really ought to be thinking about what the long-term potential impact of this is on uh, ongoing state operations um, and also, frankly, on our cash flow situation and on our reserves. Uh, situation. I suspect we're a ways away from that, but um, I've been taught that you shouldn't wait until you get to the river to think about the bridge that you have to cross over. So I wonder if you can share just a little bit about 
and again, I know I'm asking you to speculate, but um, um, your concerns about that longer term uh, shift of a potentially a new norm here. Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative, well, really good points and questions. You know, one of the, th so my job in part <clears throat> is to recommend to you all and to the governor uh, where should the state take on extra risk? Because a lot of what you're talking about is we have this normal process where we have agreements and state funds certain activities, the federal uh, government funds certain activities. We have a way to handle that with our cash flow uh, analysis, assuming we're going to get reimbursed. I mean, that's the way things normally work. Right. But our concern is uh, where do we step in as a state and help out and help ameliorate the effects of the shutdown when it's the right thing to do and people are suffering? When do we do that? And then w at what point, though, do we have to say as a state we simply can't afford or the price tag is getting too high? Or how do we ensure that we have the legal right to get the reimbursement? I mean, that's another part of this puzzle is to make sure that whatever we do uh, going forward, we never lose that opportunity to get the, the legal right to get reimbursed. So this is uncharted territory, and it makes me frankly, quite nervous because I don't know the answer. I don't know where that line is, and that's, you know, the policy decisions, decision makers, you all have to decide. And I know the governor is going to be talking about this more in depth tomorrow about what he thinks we need to do, at least in the short term, as we day-to-day, -day, week to week monitor that increasing risk that's growing literally every day. The risk grows that we're going to expend money and not get reimbursed. So how long can we do that? At what point do we do that? How many dollars? How many people do we help? Which people do we help? Mm -hmm. uh, which programs do we try to support? It's a massively complex question and a really difficult one because this partial shutdown f affects different people in different ways. And so you really have to track each one of those federal agencies, each one of those programs. Uh, you know, the, just think about the the thing that concerns me also is the, is the lack of uh, certainty that activity is being slowed down. If you were going to buy a home and you were going to close, you needed an FHA mortgage or you needed a USDA mortgage for some farmland, you were going to close, you haven't been able to do that for the last 24 days. Or if you needed to buy a house in a floodplain, you need floodplain insurance and that's not available. So those activities, those things are just stopped. And that desk is piling up now with delayed uh, activity. And so if you turn back the federal government back on tomorrow, you still have this delay and mm -hmm. that you have to catch up on. It doesn't go away. So you have a lot of activity that's being delayed. You have a lot of people who are making decisions without the normal realm of Department of Commerce uh, and USDA data that people use to make decisions. So this, this is so unusual, so out of the ordinary, uh, it's hard to know how to make that balance and how to d decide that uh, point about where you continue to support activities and people in Minnesota and yet you run the risk of getting not reimbursed by the federal government. It's a, and, and that's what we're going to be trying to do in terms of giving the governor a kind of a ballpark number about day to day that's growing and it's, we think it's X amount tomorrow and it's going to grow every week. And so that we can decide as, you know, as a state, what are we going to do? Where are we going to take on that responsibility? And how much of that can we afford to take on? And what's the legal liability that we have for that lack of payment? It's, I'm sorry, I don't have any better answers. No, it's quite, Representative Mariani. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, I, mean, I, I suspect, and the Commissioner, I suspect uh, most of us don't have better answers, right? And that's part of being in the uncharted territory. Um, it, it, <clears throat> I, I was going to ask this, but I'll just make the, a quick comment instead. Uh, and that is that um, there, there is the issue of delayed, I get that, of, of delayed activities, of assuming uh, with every day passing by uh, greater financial risk uh, on the part of the state. Um, but I suspect that in addition to that, there are processes that we employ in the delivery of services, uh, government services um, uh, to ourselves as the people that are tied to federal processes. Um, you know, so earlier we talked about financial aid and, uh, you know, our, we do financial aid. The state provides, um, you know, a generous um, and smart investment um, in, in our students as well. Those are tied to uh, federal uh, parameters and federal processes. Uh, so if that's not happening, uh, what happens to that? And I suspect that's uh, true across the board in all the, uh, all the departments 
uh, that we talked about. And so we are in a, th this is, it strikes me that this is more than just, uh, as important as it is, more than just the state uh, figuring out how to, you know, uh, patch together where the feds are, are not present right now. Um, uh, so much of what we do is tied to how the feds uh, do uh, do the work, how they regulate the delivery of, of services. That we're just so intertwined uh, with, with federal government uh, processes. Uh, I think that, uh, Mr. Chair, I think that, um, you know, there, there's going to be uh, uh, pretty soon probably a pretty strong need for our committees to have this very much at the center of our deliberations and thoughts in the coming weeks as we prepare to do our policy and appropriations work. And I do appreciate um, your work, Commissioner, and the work of, of your department. I suspect a number of the chairs here are probably going to be calling you quite a bit over the next uh, couple of months. And my only hope is that, or not only, but one of my big hopes is that um, we don't slip into a, a partisan approach to that. Uh, this, is, this is about the delivery of, of Minnesota services to Minnesotans. Um, and so to my colleagues across the, the aisle, I think there's much in which we can lock arms here just to make sure that we're, um, we're answering together the, some of the big questions that you just put on the table. Thank you. Now, Representative Mariani, I, I suspect as the uh, division chairs and the uh, committee leads are listening to this discussion that uh, there probably will be a topic in all or most of the divisions when we see how it Cuts across all of uh, state government. Um, another uh, area that I'm kind of interested in is that uh, I sit in as an observer, as does the uh, minority lead, the Council of Economic Advisors, mm -hmm. and uh, what kind of a discussion is going to take uh, place uh, there. Uh, they generally meet twice prior to uh, the release of the uh, forecast, mm -hmm. and of course, mm -hmm. the forecast comes out. I think officially the 28th of February, if I recall. Mm -hmm. And if this continues to go on, uh, there will be the question of what that means for the overall economy um, and uh, how that might uh, change our projections in terms of uh, the uh, revenue and so on that we'll have available as we uh, move forward. But we have several people on the list, so we've got you down. We're just taking you in order. Representative Wagenius is next. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, one of the things you uh, talked to us about or mentioned was that farmers are not being able to get loans processed. I don't have a sense of that issue. If you could just help us out, understand that a bit better. How many farmers do you think are involved? What's the economic impact here? Mr. Chair, Representative, I think one of the things that, that happen a lot is the USDA provide, has several um, mortgage programs for farm land. And so one of the, the uh, in order to um, close those uh, particular, or on those mortgages and those loans, obviously they have to be open and they're not. I don't have a good number on the magnitude of that in Minnesota at this point. I know uh, that the, that the uh, Department of Agriculture is taking a look at how many are processed on a regular basis. I mean, one of the things, as I mentioned, there are over 400 um, uh, farm service agency offices in the state of Minnesota. So it's, it's a, obviously a widespread uh, function, uh, the, getting that information out. But I don't have an exact number on the, how many loans uh, in, in Minnesota are closed on the USDA side of that. <laughs> Part of the problem is we can't get the information from the USDA. So we'll have the department, our Department of Agriculture is trying to put that together for us. It's a good question. I don't have that at this time. I might just mention, uh, Mr. Chair, to kind of follow up on the Council of Economic Advisors. You know, one of the things that uh, the economists, and I'm not an economist, let's make that clear. One of the things that economists say is that short-term shutdowns, a day or a few days or a week or less, really have minimal economic effect because it's just a delay of several days or a week of payments uh, and the reimbursement Get, picks up pretty quickly, but when you get a longer delay, certainly this one, then you then you start seeing economic activity changing, and that, as you allude to, is the key 
Are we going to see any negative result of delayed economic activity resulting from this uh, shutdown? And that's when the, I think the Economic Advisors, uh, Council of Economic Advisors meet in the first part of February, as, uh, their first of two meetings, and that will be a topic. And, well, hopefully it won't be a topic at that point, but uh, they'll discuss it, I'm That'd sure. Good news. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, we have, um, let's see, Representative North. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Farns, uh, my, my question is, you mentioned uh, uh, 3,000 employees uh, impacted state employees uh, who are getting federally funded. Are they all fully funded or partially funded uh, employees? Mr. Chair, Representative, well, that makes it it's, it's a little bit of both. We have a number of uh, people who work on federal programs that are fully federally funded, but we have a number of them that work maybe half time on a federal program and half time under state programs. So that makes it even more difficult. Uh, many of Many of the states uh, are able to sort of pick up the slack, if you will, on the federal funding because they can reassign that worker to other state activities and keep that going in the, in the interim and therefore uh, you know, get the state funding. But we have to go in and analyze all these different uh, federal programs and find out there's a quarter of a FDE over here, there's a half over here, and that makes the, the, the counting a little bit more difficult. But it also makes a reimbursement more challenging too because uh, our, our decision about whether to continue to pay a state worker who's federally funded only half time is different than if they're funded full time. Uh, the other question I have is uh, for Assistant Commissioner Nikki, uh, uh, the question that I have is for expedited uh, SNAP programs. If we're going to put a date on when we can process the SNAP program, uh, what is our legal and moral obligation in ensuring that those who walk through the doors of the county will get the expedited uh, SNAP uh, benefits? Mr. Chair and Representative, right now we are focused on getting all of the applications that come in through this month processed. So right now we have guaranteed federal funds for all the applications that are processed by close of business tomorrow, January 15th. Individuals still have the right and we're letting counties and tribes know that anybody that wishes to apply thereafter should be able to do so. We are taking, continuing to take applications beyond that time period. There, we've been told by the USDA that it's likely that there could be some funding for applications that are processed January 16th through the end of the month, but that is not guaranteed in the same way that the applications that are processed by the 15th have been. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, and thank you, Assistant Commissioner. I think the other issue that we are concerned about, and you uh, allude to this, is what's going to happen after February 1st? What about the new, the new applicants uh, that come after that? And that's clearly not, or it's an uncertain territory. and. Uh, um, as uh, Assistant Commissioner Farrago said, we can get people processed to apply now, but after that date, once again, the rules are likely to change, and we don't know what those rules are yet, and so we're concerned about what happens after February 1st, just as much as what happens before February 1st. Okay, um, just a reminder, if you probably saw it on the agenda, <coughs> but um, we are due to uh, adjourn in about seven minutes we might be able to run over a couple of minutes but uh, we have about four or five people so if you could make your questions very brief uh, there's a training session taking place for uh, chairs and vice chairs that uh, starts at 11 o'clock so they've asked if we wouldn't adjourn at approximately uh, 1045 so uh, Representative Liebling you're next and um, if uh, we can on both sides the questioner and the Commissioners, uh, be as brief as possible so everybody can get their question in. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, and this one is, I think, more, well, for both of the testifiers and um, Representative Neuer, great, great question. This follows right on that one. So talking about the reimbursement, um, I had heard from my county that they were going to work through the weekend to try to get those SNAP applications covered. And that makes me wonder, uh, you know, we talk about costs that are going out from the state that may or may not get reimbursed, I'm sure a lot of those costs are going to be on the counties. And so my question is whether we are 
directing the counties or helping them to collect those costs so that at least at the end of this, whenever it is, we know what those costs are and can make rational decisions about, you know, assuming that we, we have to either apply for a reimbursement or maybe we'll end up reimbursing some of that ourselves to the counties or other local governments. Are we going to have good numbers at the end? Yeah, whichever he wants to. Uh, whichever one mm -hmm. wants to answer that. Yeah. I'll try that one, sure. Mr. Okay. Chair. Well, you're both commissioners, I guess, so. Yes. Um, I always like to defer whenever I can. I, I think the, um, that's an, an excellent point. And there is a cost of the shutdown. There's a cost just uh, um, <laughs> wear and tear on me, for one. But I don't know what, <laughs> what kind of price tag you put on that. But we will. one of the things we will try to do, because, as you mentioned, there are a lot of people working over this weekend, both at, in our office but around the DHS, Department of uh, Human Services and around the state and counties and tribes trying to get this information done for tomorrow, right? I think it end. So we'll try to make sure we gather that information because there is an actual cost uh, to do that, especially over time and over the weekends in addition to doing our other jobs. We're trying to get this stuff done too, so that's a good point. We'll try to make sure we have good data to show you what it costs. Yeah. Okay, and then we have Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Franz, I have a constituent named Sarah Dora who um, has a son who has a life-threatening illness and uh, was awaiting a drug trial. She was told by uh, the doctor that the drug trial has been postponed with the FDA shutdown. Um, I'm curious if you're hearing mm -hmm. other impacts from the FDA shutdown in terms of drug trials or other drug research in Minnesota. Mr. Chair, Representative, no, I had not. I'm glad to hear that. I think I'm sorry to hear that that's happening. I did not know that that kind, those kind of programs would would be affected. I would have thought those would be called essential and would continue or critical. But uh, we'll look into that. I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you, Representative. Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got uh, questions for both of the testifiers. Ms. Farragut, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, you'd spoken of SNAP benefits. My concern is. Uh, federally subsidized uh, food programs at daycares uh, at schools, both breakfasts and lunches, uh, as well as the Head Start program. Can you speak at all to the impact of the shutdown on those and any concerns you have? Mr. Chair, Mr. Representative Davney, um, those programs are processed through the Minnesota Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, so I do not have the information on that today, but we can follow up with the other state agencies to get that information to this committee. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Commissioner, two, un, uh, Franz, two unrelated questions, but the more, the, more we, uh, the more we talk, the more questions I have. One, uh, I know Congress has passed a bill to require the uh, back pay for federal employees who are unemployed through this, but that doesn't cover contractors, whether those be a professional engineer that contracts with the federal government on a program, or I think more commonly it's the lowest paid workers. It's that the federal government has contracted out for custodial services or uh, food service, uh, and those folks are negatively impacted and not covered by the, the bill that Congress has passed. The president has said he would sign, but his reliability isn't Great, so I haven't seen that he's signed it. Do you know anything about the impact uh, on those Minnesotans who are contract workers for the federal government? And secondly, uh, to the IRS uh, situation, uh, would that impact the ability for parents to fill out the FAFSA form? FAFSA February is coming up, and an aspect uh, the last few years of filling out the federal student aid form has been the ability to automatically uh, populate income uh, data from the IRS, and that's an uh, important aspect of uh, accessibility to higher education for many students. Mr. Chair, Mr. Representative, well, on the contractor front, that is a huge problem, and we're trying to get our hand, the hand around the, the number of contractors. As, you, as I mentioned, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 18, 19,000 federal employees, uh, but the number of contractors, it's a large number of contractors, people who only work, get paid if they work, and those people are really completely out of luck at this point because they're not working. There's no back pay to pay them. They have nothing to show for it because they haven't had an opportunity to work. And, and so I know that I've talked to Senator Smith and her office about this, and they've been working on trying to get a better handle on that. But that is a, uh, it's a huge, in fact, for the, for the federal employees, about one in eight 
of federal employees are on the really low end of the income spectrum. But in the federal contracting area, the same thing is true. There's a sizable percentage of federal contractors that are on, that are on the bottom of the pay scale. And so they, they're really going to be suffering at this time because they have no recourse at this time other than unemployment. In the education area, the, now the thing about the excellent question, the thing about FAST, I mean, that loads based upon data that's there. So the question really becomes, uh, is there, do you, do you have the data in the system and it will load automatically if it's there, but the question is, is, is it there? Is there something that you need to update or is there some, uh, is the last year? I mean, they, what the IRS tries to do is to continue to process those, and a lot of those are kind of automatic. You file your return, and those, that information becomes accessible to the FAST return when you try to load on that information. So that generally should be there, but generally doesn't sort of work these days, right? So I, that, I didn't, wasn't thinking about that, but that's actually something we'll check with uh, the Office of Higher Education on. Is there going to be a potential delays in that, filling out the FAST forms if that data is not immediately available? I don't know. Thank you, thank you, Commissioners. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. We have two more people on the list, and uh, after they're done, I've got a couple of announcements, and then we will uh, need to adjourn. The next one is uh, Representative Hornstein. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to reiterate Representative Mariani's appreciation for all the extra work that, that both of you are doing. Um, I'm trying to get a handle on uh, the employees that are working, working without pay, some that are furloughed and not working. Uh, you know, a case study comes to mind with the Department of Homeland Security. I'm, I'm hearing um, media reports that, the, that, that you have, um, you know, the security personnel at the, at the airport, you know, working, but there's less of them. Uh, so do you have a sense of, of who's working, who's not, who's getting paid, who's not? I mean, obviously no one's getting paid, but who's working without pay, who isn't? Is there a sense of, of that? Mr. Chair, Representative, well, it's an interesting mosaic, if you will, because one of the things that's happening, and the federal government uses terminology that we really don't use at the state. They call, they make a determination if, a, if an agency has, doesn't have its funding, like the Department of Justice, those, uh, that agency is essentially shut down. But then they bring back on people who they call essential workers. Now, in Minnesota, we take, use the term critical. We believe all of our employees are essential. We wouldn't have hired them in the first place. But secondly, if they provide critical services, then they may need to stay on for the health and safety of people. So like TSA and FBI agents and Coast Guard folks, those folks have been determined to be essential under the federal definition, and they're required to show up for work and not get paid. The people who are determined not to be essential under the federal system are furloughed without pay, but they're not working. So it really, you have to look at each one of the agencies. Uh, I mean, and the main ones are Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice. Uh, those are the areas where you see some of the Department of Treasury. They brought, like I said, about 10,000 people out of over 100,000 people. The IRS has determined to be essential under their terminology. So you have to go to each agency and look at that analysis to see who's working, who's not working, and then who's being forced to work without being paid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Hertals with the last question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Commissioner Franz, you did mention something regarding real estate transactions and uh, the inference at least that FEMA is the only one that issues flood insurance, but there are a number of uh, private insurers that do cover and issue flood insurance. So I would expect that many of those transactions won't be affected Generally, if somebody is seeking a MAP amendment because their property they want to close on uh, is in the flood zone, those take six to eight weeks to get done anyway, and usually the transactions move forward with private insurance without it. Uh, certainly, as you mentioned, uh, if a loan is being securitized or underwritten by USDA or HUD or something of that nature, those loans certainly are in jeopardy in terms of closing. And even with FSA, there are other sources to get operating loans in terms of uh, farm credit. Um, uh, maybe Mr. Vogel would do that. <laughs> Thank you. I think that was more comment than uh, yes. or an update yes. than uh, a yeah. question. Yeah.